Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alessandro, and thank you for the kind invitation to speak this afternoon. I can only wish all of you as best as best luck as we can in these circumstances. But uh, let's uh, con con concentrate on the electronics today, and uh, uh, let me try to share my screen. Is that visible for people? Yes. Okay. So the title of the talk is Hybrid Pixel Detectors from the Discovery of the Higgs Boson to New Modalities in Medical Imaging. And uh, this is a kind of little history of the MediPix collaboration in some senses and with a particular focus on a couple of the chips and uh, some a, a, a look at some of the um, applications of our, our devices as well. So the MediPix collaborations, as Alessandro said, have been running for Quite a number of years. We started in 1999 with the MediPix 2 collaboration with 16 members shown here. The MediPix 3 collaboration was some years later, six years later, and then the MediPix 4 collaboration was in 2016. And there we have, uh, I think, 16, 16 or 17 members now. Uh, during the time, we've developed a number of readout ASICs, so that's uh, readout chips. And basically, in the context of the MediPix 2 collaboration, we developed three ASICs, MediPix 2, TimePix and MediPix and TimePix 2. In MediPix 3, we developed two ASICs, MediPix 3 and TimePix 3. And in MediPix 4, we developed two ASICs, MediPix 4 and TimePix 4. And um, as you can see here, a number of those ASICs have been licensed to commercial uh, vendors for sale. So the way the collaboration works is that the collaboration members are exclusively research institutes so that the development is driven by science. And then if we make a chip, which companies are interested in, we will license it to them later. So you can see those are the licensees on this slide here. So just to uh, give an outline of the talk, I'll start with a, a brief introduction to hybrid pixel detectors. I'll show how those were used and developed for high energy physics. Then a few words about the Medipix and TimePix families and then some examples of the TimePix use of the TimePix, the MediPix 3 and the TimePix 3 chips. And in fact, for TimePix and TimePix 3, I'm hoping to make a, a kind of live demonstration of particle detection. And then say a few words at the end about tiling large areas and where we are with our TimePix 4 developments. Now, if you want to ask a question, you may interrupt me, just, uh, just raise a hand or, or call out and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. So this is the very, very basic introductory slide. It just tells what the, um, how the, um, um, oops. it just tells how, how the uh, detectors are, are made, basically. So what we have is we have a sensor, which is segmented into pixels of equal dimension. And each of those sensor pixels is connected to its own readout pixel, which is on a readout electronics chip shown here. And, um, the typical dimensions here are kind of 50 microns in one dimension and in the other. And we have something like a few hundred by a few hundred pixels per chip. So when ionizing radiation goes through the sensor, as shown here, it deposits charge as it goes. The sensor is biased electrically, such that any charge deposited in the sensor is collected by a diode. And then the charge pulse is then processed in the individual pixel which is underneath the, uh, the uh, sensor element. So the big advantage of hybrid pixel detectors is that you have uh, basically noise-free images because the typical charge deposition is of the order of a few thousand electrons. We can set a threshold that's say five or 600 electrons and the noise of the front end electronics is around hundred electrons. So that means that if you set that threshold well above the noise, then every particle arriving in the sensor is detected and if there are no particles arriving in the sensor, nothing's detected. So you essentially get images which are free of noise. We can use any kind of CMOS technology we like here. So we've basically over the years followed Moore's law by going to finer and finer um, feature size for the reader electronics. And then we can also change the sensor material according to the application. So typically in high energy physics, this material is made of silicon because it's cheap and very uniform. 
But in other applications, such as X-ray detection, you'd like to have a sensor material which is a bit more um, um, absorbing to X-rays, and something like gallium arsenide or cadmium telluride then becomes a better choice for the, uh, for the sensor material. And in some cases, you can completely do away with the sensor altogether and replace this either by a gas gain grid on top, a microchannel plate, or as we'll see later in one of the examples, this time actually from Ukraine, you can use nothing at all on top except to put a kind of grid which gives an, an electric field on top of the, uh, of the chip. So where did it all begin? This is back in the uh, 1990s where we started to develop pixel detectors for fixed ion, fixed ion uh, fixed target experiments at CERN. So this is a lead ion hitting a lead target at the, um, at the SPS in CERN. And here what we have is an image of basically looking down seven planes of five by five centimeters of pixels. And what this image shows is that uh, in these half million pixels which are present here, there isn't a single red dot there. And the red dot is a pixel which has been hit, which hasn't been associated with one of those tracks. So the image is basically noise free. But of course, back in those days, the precision of the, uh, let's say the width of the shutter was a microsecond and the trigger rate we could deal with was a kilohertz, which is far from what was required for LHC. But over the years between the, the middle of the 90s and the, uh, and the 2000s, a number of readout chips were developed for, the, uh, for use at the, um, uh, at the LHC. This is the example of the Atlas pixel detector, which I wasn't personally involved in, but which is one of, the, uh, one of the large detectors at CERN. And here they constructed basically three concentric layers of pixels at radii 5, 9 and 12 centimetres from the interaction point. And basically those were constructed of um, uh, little ladders, which were uh, about that size with 16 readout chips uh, on them each. And in total, they had about 80 million pixels in the, uh, in the detector. And this is just an example. I think this is the outer layer of the Atlas barrel being, being constructed to show you the engineering involved in the, uh, in the, in the fabrication of the, um, of the staves here. So the chips are in, under each of these green uh, elements here. The kind of images which were able to be taken in Atlas are shown here. So this represents an area of five and a half centimeters by a few centimeters and shows that in a single 25 nanosecond uh, interaction, they were able to reconstruct something like 20 or 30 uh, interaction, individual interaction points in the, uh, in the center of the detector. And in fact, before the Higgs boson discovery was announced at the LHC, there were something like 10 to the 15 of these interactions taking place. So you can imagine that if the detector at the very center of these experiments weren't able to take very clean images such as this one, it would have been impossible to, uh, to really find these 1,000 interactions which generated Higgs bosons out of the 10 to the 15 events which took place. So the pixel detectors had an important role to play in the, uh, in the discovery of the Higgs, along with the other detectors which were part of the big experiments, of course. But during those, uh, the development of a pixel detector for the LHC, we asked ourselves a number of questions. We said, but what if each pixel, uh, instead of just recording a hit, was able to actually count hits locally to construct an image? And what if we could measure the charge in each of those pixels too? And therefore, could we make what we could think of as color X-ray images? So basically, bin X-rays according to the, to the energies. And that was what led to the uh, Edipix family of readout chips. And I'll mention just here two of the Medipix collaboration chips. So one was the Medipix 2 chip, which was developed, the first chip developed 20 years ago. It has 256 by 256 pixels on a, a pitch of 55 microns. And basically it had a single window of energy discrimination per, uh, per, uh, per pixel. And how this chip works is you kind of opened a shutter, you counted the number of X-rays which fell between these two energy windows, you close the shutter and then read everything out. So it was a kind of uh, camera logic, if you like. And we use the same logic some years later to make the, uh, or a, a similar logic to make the, the Medipix 3 chip. But in this case, uh, we 
had a more sophisticated approach to dealing with the charge uh, sharing between pixels, and I'll explain how we, we did that in a, in a few slides' times. And so that's the uh, description of the, let's say, the summary of the Meripix 3 chips, which were the Meripix chips which were developed. And of course, this, this talk is going to focus on uh, a little bit on the Meripix 3 chip. It was made in a 130 nanometer CMOS process in 2013. And here, one of the uh, interesting features is that the pixels can be configured to read out sensors with a pitch of 55 microns or 110 microns. And I'll explain why we did that later. But there are up to eight thresholds in uh, energy, as opposed to the basically uh, single threshold of energy, which we had, or, or let's say single window of energy we had back in the, uh, with Meripix 2. And then we asked ourselves, having done the Meripix chips, what if we were more interested in studying incoming particles one by one? And instead of measuring the energy with a limited number of bins, we basically tried to measure the energy of each incoming interaction at the pixel level and then send that information off chip. And then if you could do that, why wouldn't you try to measure also the time at which the, uh, the particle arrives? And this is what led us to the TimePix family of chips. So the Medipix and TimePix family of chips were very uh, closely related and, and designed by the same teams. So the TimePix chip, the original TimePix chip was designed in 2005. It had an identical readout to Medipix 2. It had this camera logic, so expose count uh, readout. But during the counting process, you could choose between measuring the number of counts, measuring the energy deposited per pixel, or measuring the arrival time per pixel. And then much later, we did the TimePix 3 chip. And here we basically changed the way we read out the chip entirely. So the, the concept was still to measure energy and time at the individual pixel level. But instead of having a frame-based readout where you open a shutter, wait for particles to arrive, close the shutter, read things out. In the case of TimePix 3, every time a pixel is hit, we spontaneously send all of its information off chip uh, uh, without any trigger. So that means it has a, a completely different readout, system, uh, readout concept from the previous chips. And we were able to tie, tag the arrival time of the, um, of the particles on the TimePix 3 chip with a precision of 1.6 nanoseconds. So those are the kind of summary of the, of the TimePix chip. So I'll skip TimePix 2 because of time. But basically TimePix, as I said, was developed in 2005 for these 55 micron pixels at a time stamp precision of 10 nanoseconds and time pick three was much later, so 2014, almost 10 years later, at a time sample of 1.5 or 1.6 nanoseconds. So just to descri describe a bit more um, uh, graphically how this uh, hybrid counting electronics works in, in, in terms of electronic circuits. So if you imagine that this is the, uh, the input node of the pixel, there's a preamplifier. If you look at the output node of the preamplifier, we get a pulse, which is whose height is proportional to the incoming charge. We send this pulse through a discriminator, and the discriminator can measure basically anything which is, ab which is above its threshold. And what you can see from the trace here is that for a noise of a typical noise of 60 electrons, you can set a threshold of 600, and basically the noise, the images, is without any any background noise. So. This is a, a kind of timing diagram of how you would do counting, basically. So a single pulse of charge comes, the discriminator fires at above threshold for this time here, and you basically just count one each time a pixel arrives. So that's practical counting. But then if you want to do arrival time, you can measure the time from when the discriminator fires until the end of the shutter, which is what was done in time peaks two, SRN time peaks. Or you can measure the time above threshold which gives a measure of the energy of the deposited charge. This is the number of clock ticks while the uh, screen is above threshold. We've, over the years, uh, together with the Institute in Prague, made a miniature readout system called uh, USB Light, which is shown here. It's a basically USB, uh, uh, basic USB system. And most recently, a, 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 um, a version of this has been made for uh, use in, uh, in the educational settings called the Minipix Edu, which is shown here. And now what I'm going to try to do is to demonstrate to you how 
this chip actually is able to, to detect extrins. Can I stop? I'm going to start some software here. So I'm going to move my camera down. I don't know, can you can you see the chip here on my desk? I have trouble to see myself actually. Yeah, so you can see the chip there. And what I hope I'm sharing is the uh, the, the data acquisition screen for the uh, for the, the detector here. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm taking images from this detector of the background radiation in the room. So it's actually pretty low. Uh, and for five half a second intervals, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one by one different kinds of radioactive sources and how they interact with the silicon sensor. So here you can see these little lights or dots shining on the uh, sensor. So what I've done is I've put this is a cadmium source, which is on top of the uh, on, on top of the chip. And you can see that the cadmium source gives. Uh, I just got a message from Penelope to see you can't see my source. Sorry, I'm not sharing it properly. Thanks, Penelope. Sorry. So this is. No, this, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. Great. So thanks. So I'll start again the data acquisition <laughs> to prove that when there's nothing there. Uh, so it's actually running uh, acquisitions just now. So basically, you see. Nothing uh, happening just now. Then I bring this cadmium source closer to it here. And I think you can see that there are these dots appearing on the uh, on the screen. And those dots are due to the interaction of the 22 and 25 keV photons with the uh, with the silicon matrix. So that's a, a gamma source. I'm now going to come to the detector with an alpha source, which is a bit more tricky to handle. So here. When I put alphas on top, we see that the kind of interaction the alpha has with the sensor is quite different. So it makes these kind of big blobs of charge. And just to prove that I'm really seeing the alphas, I can cover the sensor half with a, a piece of paper and try to bring the alpha source back close to it. And so what you can see is that the alpha source, oops, at the bottom, the alphas are being detected, but ab above where the paper is, only the gammas are getting through. So now you've seen alphas and gammas with this detector. And the last source I have, this is why I'm sitting in the lap here at CERN actually, with my phone badge on, is a source of um, betas. And when I open it, you see that this is a very, very strong source. So I'm going to leave the source on top of the detector for a second. And then I'm going to shorten the, uh, the acquisition time because in that way we can see better. So now we have half a second. Now I'm going to go to a millisecond acquisition then. And then you can see the individual interactions of the uh, of the betas with the, uh, so if I zoom in here, you can see the one beta here is given a kind of wormy shape, another one has an interaction somewhere in the silicon. But basically you can, by eye, distinguish between alphas, betas, and gammas using such a detector. So this is something which we thought was very um, attractive for use in uh, classrooms, or at least where people can have access to radioactive sources. And um, I'm going to continue sharing the screen. And so we've had a number of um, schools who started to use this in the classroom, and that's why this this chip is called um, this chip is called EduPix. Uh, sorry, MiniPix Edu, and. Um, an example of where this has been used in school is uh, the, this project in, um, in uh, Barcelona, in Spain, where they have uh, used the, um, the chip in a number of classrooms and they've had uh, high school children using this uh, chip. This is them using an X-ray uh, machine with the detector inside to make X-ray images. And this is another, another example of the, the student here and she's, she has the uh, detector basically monitoring the background radiation in the environment around the uh, around Barcelona. So the same uh, device is used in the space station. So this is the same uh, device here uh, in the cupola of the of the space station. And basically, we've had something like six of those sensors running continuously on the space station for about six or seven years or so, uh, continuously monitoring the background to which the astronauts are exposed. And 
this is an example of a, a four second exposure taken uh, over the South China Sea. So you can see that basically in four seconds, there isn't that much, but that they have in orbit some uh, kind of interacts with heavy ions, which we typically wouldn't get uh, uh, at, at ground level. Whereas when those people go through the South Atlantic anomaly, which is above Argentina, you see that they get in the same four second interval quite a lot more dose. And you can take those uh, that information about the interactions and try to figure out which particles are which, and then make a map of the uh, of the dose per day, which the astronauts are exposed to, and then reimpose that on the trajectory of the spacecraft. And here you can really well distinguish that as the space station is flying through the South Atlantic anomaly, these astronauts are getting essentially a bit more than double the typical uh, dose rate, which people on ground level get in a year. But it's only for the short time of traveling through that. And the rest of the time, they're still getting significantly more than we're getting, but, uh, but, but less of the same. So because of that, uh, NASA decided to fly a couple of those uh, time pitch ships on the Orion space ro rocket back in 2014. And they made a movie. So this is the uh, trajectory, just follow the mouse here, of the space rocket going on its first turn around uh, the Earth. But it was still in basically low Earth orbit, so you see the color blue, so it's uh, the dose is rather low. Whereas the second time around, they went out into outer space for the first time in a long time, and at that point, they go through the Van Allen belts. So you can see that the the color seen or the the extra dose measured by the um, by the detector is significantly higher uh, as they go through there. So basically, NASA have baselined the time peak technology for use in space, future missions for monitoring the background radiation to, to astronauts. And in fact, their next, uh, their next stop with time peak, this is the time peak three ship, in fact, is the moon. And this is an ex example, this is a, basically a product now from the Advacam company in Prague, led by Jan Jakubek, who was um, a physicist in one of the, in the main, main institute there in Prague. And here he's showing the, um, the Czech Prime Minister how the, how the system is going to work on the, on the surface of the moon. So the same company have made some large area detectors of Meripix or Time Pix and Time Pix 3. And they've used those in uh, an interesting uh, application. So here, is, uh, here are two robots. And basically these two robots collaborate with each other. So you can basically make those robots surround an object like this one and try to figure out what's inside and basically make a color X-ray image of that object. Now, one such application they used it for was this uh, a painting, which was signed by Vincent van Gogh, but no one really is sure if it's truly a Vincent van Gogh. It's a Provencal scene, as you can see. Uh, but they'd made a, a spectroscopic extra image of that. And what you can see immediately, so you can see the wood here of the frame, but you can also see that something begins to show up behind the, uh, behind the scene of Provence. And by kind of digging a bit through the, uh, uh, spectroscopic data and trying to tag different elements of the painting with uh, different materials. And then turning it around, you start to see that shape taking life. And then by further kind of image processing, you can reconstruct what appears to be a drawing of a naked woman, which was done uh, underneath the painting of, of Van Gogh. And that's a paint, a, a drawing which Van Gogh made around the same time. So you can see that the style is very similar. So this painting has never been authenticated for reasons known best to the owner of the painting. But um, essentially, if it ever were authenticated, it would be the, the first painting to be authenticated on the basis of having two paintings in one. Uh, and that's thanks to the having access to this uh, spectroscopic absorption of the x-rays in, uh, in the painting. And then maybe one, just one last example of the use of the time peak strip. Uh, in this time in a scientific application. This was some work done by Valerie Pugach some years ago, uh, together with our group here. Uh, but he basically borrowed a system from our group. But instead of using um, a silicon sensor on top of the chip, he just put a, a, a grid of, um, of metal on top. So he called it a I think metal pixel detector. And essentially what he's doing is, this is a, a mass spectrometry system. So the laser ablates the uh, sample here. Uh, charged particles are accelerated 
through this uh, system of accelerating electrodes here. And then the uh, various masses are, are separated in the magnetic field and then uh, sent down according to the mass onto the, uh, onto the pixel uh, surface. And basically those ions which hit the pixel surface hit the metal of the pads, produce secondary electrons, and those secondary electrons are kind of sucked away by the grid which Valerie's placed on top. And by doing so, you can basically, he scanned three parts of the chip with the same uh, with, with the same beam and proven that it had a very very nice and uniform response of the uh, of the chip to the uh, to the uh, to the ions from this um, mass spectrometer. Compared with the hybrid detector, of course, where you have a silicon sensor on top, you get a significantly lower detection efficiency. But on the other hand, you have something which is not going to get easily damaged by radiation, and which is a very uniform uh, uniform response. So switching now to Meripix 3, uh, this is a chip which I said earlier was developed in 2013. It has the possibility of being connected to 55 or 110 micron pixels. And when you're connected in a 110 micron sensor pixel, you can have up to eight thresholds per readout pixel, uh, per, per 110 micron pixel. And the basic problem of high resolution extra imaging is shown in this following slides. So if you have a, a sensor material where you have an X-ray photon depositing its energy locally, even provided that energy is deposited only in one position, as the uh, charge drifts to the collection electrode, some might spill over into its neighbor. So the spectrum seen by the individual pixel here is not clean, even where there's only been an individual interaction. In the case where you have to use a higher absorbing material like cadmium telluride or gallium arsenide, it's more complicated because not only do you have a, a single hit where the photon first interacts with material, but then there's a very high probability of kicking out a fluorescence photon, which will deposit charge somewhere in the neighborhood. And then you have two hits for the price of one, and those go to individual separate pixels. So we thought, how can we basically make electronics, which is able to reconstruct the energy of the incoming spectrum, which is what you'd like to do, if you'd like to make high resolution spectroscopic images. Just to re-emphasize here this fluorescence effect, basically, if you have silicon, the fluorescence energy is 1.7 keV and it travels 12 microns, so basically it doesn't affect your image at all. But as soon as you go to heavy materials like gallium arsenide, you're looking at something like almost 50 microns of mean free path of the fluorescence photon. And if you go to something <clears throat> even more absorbing like cadmium telluride, it can go up to kind of 150 microns far the uh, the deposition of fluorescence photons. So the electronics has to deal with that. So the concept we implemented in Meripix 3 is shown here. So when a, a, a pixel shares its charge between neighboring pixels, these pixels determine what the charge is locally. They identify the pixel with the highest charge. And at the same time as that's going on, at every pixel corner, we're summing charges to try to get the charge in the neighborhood of those pixels. And then the charge, let's say the corner of the hit pixel with the highest charge is allocated the hit. And that's how we can reconstruct the, uh, the spectrum cleanly, uh, even in the environment where the, the photons are arriving at quite high rate. And these are some examples from material imaging using uh, the Meripix 3RX chip from our colleagues in New Zealand. So this is a number of, um, it's a phantom containing a number of different materials which are typically used in, uh, in medical imaging. And here you can see that when you have access to the X-ray information, it becomes quite easy to distinguish, say, between, from, between gadolinium from iodine and iodine from gold, so that you can really well determine a material's composition by how much is absorbed or which energies or which frequencies are absorbed in the, um, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the phantom. And they took that further. They built a small animal scanner. This is shown here. This was a, a rat which was uh, uh, scanned uh, after it was uh, after it was deceased, and basically what they did before there, before they killed the rat, was that they uh, injected gold, gadolinium, and iodine, and you can see that the uh, the gold accumulates in some organs, the gadolinium in others, and the iodine in the bloodstream, and you can see the basically the power of the spectroscopic. Um, uh, 
um, resolution in the uh, in the X-ray domain for medical imaging. And basically, here these metals were used as contrast agents. But the big question for the future is: Could we develop uh, biomarkers with such metals attached, which could be used to make functional imaging in the X-ray domain, which would obviate or get rid of the need for making uh, images in the in the pet uh, environment? And this is the first human scan being made. This is the professor of physics now retired in uh, in New Zealand, having his uh, his leg scanned with his scanner here, and you can see that in a conventional x-ray, you get a very nice image of the bone and you need an MRI to see the soft tissue because it's not at all well imaged by the, uh, by the x-rays because there's basically no contrast. Whereas when you, when, you do the, uh, when you take the Mars image, you can basically look at different features of the, um, uh, uh, of the spectrum or elements of the spectrum and reconstruct the bone, reconstruct fat and reconstruct water. And they made this kind of movie of, of the uh, reconstruction of the, the, uh, his ankle. And if I stop that somewhere here, what you can see is that they well di distinguish between normal tissue, yellow here is fatty tissue, white here is bone with a very high uh, resolution. And you, you can see basically the potential of this uh, spectroscopic extra imaging. This image made the news in a lot of countries. It was seen 40 million times on Twitter. I don't know if that's of any relevance these days, but um, it also gave a number, a high number of hits on the CERN website. And uh, they made some nice publications. This is one of Nature Reviews Physics, where you can see uh, uh, some, uh, some growth in the, um, in the throat of a, of a, this is an excised part of a, of a, of a, of a patient's uh, artery here. So this scanner is now in Lausanne Hospital. This is the scanner arriving last summer. And every couple of years, we organize a, a workshop here at CERN where the people who were, uh, let's say, convinced that spectroscopic X-ray imaging in medicine would become uh, of use have met. So we've met there since 2011. And all of the big manufacturers come, the big medical schools come, and the uh, physicists who are involved in this come as well, and the electronic engineers. So that we try to really make a community of, um, of people who've been pushing this, uh, pushing this material. And the news is that in last, just last year, Siemens were basically the first uh, company to be able to get federal FDA approval for the, uh, for the use of such a scanner uh, in, the medical, in the medical field. So switching now to time picks, which was more oriented towards detection of single particles, which is maybe more of interest to people interested in particle physics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, time peak three is, uh, is uh, the, um, the basic specs are shown here, but here are some more details. Um, basically, we have this 55, uh, 55 micron pitch as usual. As I said earlier, we can detect energy and arrival time simultaneously. We have noise of 60 electrons uh, and Probably the most interesting feature here is that we can tag the arrival time of particles to 1.6 nanoseconds. And what I'm going to try to do, do now is show you a second demonstration of how the TimePix 3 chip uh, actually detects those particles. So I'm going to stop sharing now um, and replace my TimePix detector with the time pick three detector. So this is the time pick detector. It goes away. Three detector comes in. Yeah. Let's start the software. Remember to share the screen this time. So Penelope, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so this is the time breaks detector here. And I've got my 
Strong same source again with a one millisecond exposure time. I'm going to open it, hold the detector, and try to demonstrate that working. Auto range. So there you can see that the uh, strontium source is in, indeed detecting um, individual particles, but you can see that there's quite a few particles there. So what I'm going to try and do is make it a little bit even shorter, the acquisition time, so we can see those particles one by one. I'm trying to get a nice isolated particle that I can show to you, maybe here. So this is the TOT information, the time over threshold, so the energy information shown here. And then in this case, I can switch on the TOA information, which is the arrival time information. And what you can see here is that the particle basically uh, hit the sensor here and then drifted towards the collection electrode over here. So those colors represent the time it took the charge to drift up through the, uh, through the sense material. So this means that if you can imagine what you're seeing there is a three-dimensional image of the, uh, of the deposit deposition of those uh, electrons in the, um, in the sensor material. So the next question is, what can you do with that? And of course, one big benefit of the, such collaboration is that we have many, many bright physicists, each of them with different ideas. Let me show this screen again. So back to PowerPoint, I hope. Yes. Yes, so what we saw there was basically something shown here. The track we saw wasn't as straight as this one, but if you have a muon going through the sensor, you can basically determine the uh, angle of the incidence by the collection time. Some of our physicist friends, they did this in the uh, north area of CERN. So here you have um, a pion going through a 500 micron thick sensor and a delta electron being kicked out at the same time. And the, basically the, the diameter of the, uh, of the bubbles here represents the quantity of energy de determined by the, uh, by the uh, sensors which are on the on this plane here. And you, excuse me, you can really reconstruct very nicely in three dimensions such a, such a hit. And this is just another projection of a similar hit. So where you have a highly uh, energetic particle going straight through the sensor, kicking out a delta electron, and basically you have a three dimensional image of the, of the track. So that's in high energy physics, but uh, the people in Advocam were thinking, how can we use that for another purpose? And their idea was to make a, a single layer Compton camera so the Compton effect is that if you have a, a source in a room, and this is your cadmium telluride detector here, when the photon from the source arrives in the detector, it hits locally and then gets Compton scattered to another place. And if you have uh, the information about the, the, uh, the Z dimension, which we get from the time, the energy uh, deposited locally and of the two hits, then you can reconstruct a cone from which the uh, from which the um, uh, the uh, the source was, the uh, photon was emitted, and if you have a number of those hits in the same sensor, you add the cones together, and you can basically reconstruct the uh, scene. So the big advantage of the Compton camera over something like uh, a pinhole camera is that in the case of a pinhole camera, you have to very much reduce the area over which you admit uh, uh, the photons. Uh, and, and so you get much lower efficiency, whereas a Compton camera, you're basically sensitive over the whole surface of the, uh, of the detection uh, detector itself. And so this is just an example. They had a number of sources in their lab, which they tried to reconstruct with, their, uh, with a single chip Compton camera. And those here, here they, they show basically the, uh, the reconstruction of these iodine, iodine sources. And the, uh, the big idea they have, which they haven't yet proven, but is to make um, a kind of a crown. So a number of those uh, um, uh, detectors, which we placed in a crown around the uh, throat of a patient. Because today when patients go for, and it's typically women who have these issues with the thyroid, when they go for this thyroid scan, 
they're scanned with a, a very kind of ancient uh, angular camera system, which has got lots of lead and uh, is very inefficient and poor re resolution. So they reckon that by using uh, a, a number of these uh, chips, they could probably get a five times improvement in the uh, in the uh, spatial resolution in, in 3D as well as 3D information, and at the same time as a four times lower dose to the patient. So this could be a very exciting application of the uh, of the time picks type technology if it comes to uh, if it ever comes to the market. So so far I've discussed um, basically using the the uh, chip. Uh, let's say individual chips uh, or maybe an, an array of chips in one dimension or so. But of course, what you would like to do ultimately is to make a, a large two dimensional area uh, full of those chips. So this kind of shows the, um, the concept that we had in mind. So you would like to have a sensor, which was sensitive right to the edge, which you can do with carbon telluride with silicon as well. Connect that to an ASIC, which is a, an array just of bump bonds connected to the sensor. And then bring the I.O. of the ASIC through the back of the chip to some kind of PCB and then out of the chip. And uh, this is what we've tried to implement uh, in the MediPix4 and, and uh, TimePix4 designs. And I'm going to explain to you how we've, uh, we've attacked that now. So basically TimePix4, it's basically was designed the first version in 2019. We're on the, I think, version number two now. It's, I think we, we think the final version. It has a very large area. It's um, 448 by 512 pixels or 55 microns. So it's about seven square centimeters in, uh, in chip area. But it is, uh, it can be <clears throat> butted on four sides. And it still has this data driven uh, readout. And we've improved the timing resolution with respect to time peak three by going from 1.5 nanoseconds to 200 picoseconds. And so I'm going to do, th this is just the, uh, a summary of what I've just said. Um, I don't think I need to repeat this. Basically, at the level of the individual pixel, you have um, uh, a preamplifier with various uh, feedback elements, which can be used depending on the application. Uh, that's connected to a front end um, uh, digital part where you're recording all kinds of information, which I'm going to explain in a second. And then the interesting feature of TimePix 4 now is that the the uh, pixels are actually grouped by groups of eight pixels together for the digital readout. And I'll explain how this works now. So basically when the preamplifier is hit, this is a, a kind of an approximation to the pulse of the preamplifier. So it's got a peaking time of 25 nanoseconds. The discriminator fires here and it stops over threshold here. We have a 40 megahertz clock running continuously. And that clock is synchronous with the, uh, basically a global a time of arrival. So that time of arrival is recorded. Uh, that clock tick is recorded when the uh, when the uh, threshold goes high and when the threshold goes low. But each time the discriminator fires, we start a fast VCO locally, which is shared between those eight pixels, and we stop it at the next rising edge of the clock. And this is how we get from the 25 nanosecond interval to the 1.6 nanosecond precision we need for measuring the arrival time. And we do the same on the on the falling edge of the clock. The um, uh, the time over threshold is measured similarly, but using the forty megahertz clock and also using this information here from the uh, uh, right, um, rising and falling time of the uh, of the um, uh, of the of the clock. So this way we get to the basically the one point six nanosecond precision. And as I mentioned earlier, we have to go to 200 picoseconds. And the 200 picosecond precision is got by, if you go back here to look at the, the VCO in the previous slide, um, basically when the VCO is running, there are a, a number of basically kind of, if you can think of them as current starred inverters, which are in a loop. And when we stop or start the VCO, those have a particular internal state which we save and it's access to those bits inside the VCO itself, which give us the 200 picosecond precision in the timing we need for, for, for uh, time peak four. So this is the floor plan of the chip. It's kind of turned on its side here. We have two matrices of uh, uh, 224 by, by um, sorry, 448 by 224, uh, sorry, 256 by 400, 
um, 448 pixels, two matrices. And then we have, in order to accommodate the, uh, the IO at the top, middle and bottom of the chip, the active pixels on the ASIC are smaller than the pixels on the sensor. And this is shown here. So basically, this is the edge of the chip, which you would normally cut off if you're making TSV processing. And between the active pixels and that edge, we have a redistribution there, which takes the connections from the pixels of the sensor back to the pixels of the reader electronics, so that we, um, we basically cover the chip right until the end. Now, the other thing we've done here, of course, is that we don't always use through silicon via processing under the uh, active matrix. So we, we have these wire bond extenders, which permit us to use single chips on the um, uh, on cards. But just to have a, a, another look at how the, let's see the top layer of metal and the uh, uh, looks. So the top layer of metal here is shown in purple. These are the bonding pads, which are connected to the sensor. And then the bottom layers of metal are shown here. And this is how the uh, IO is connected to the outside. So the IO is basically underneath the, uh, the sensitive area of the pixels. These are images showing measurements of the uh, of the hole in the electron collection of the of the uh, chip, the electrical test, which are basically consistent with simulation. This is a measurement of the arrival time uh, measurement. So with um, time picks three, we were limited here in the resolution of arrival time, and with time picks four, we get really right down to the uh, to the sub two hundred picosecond timing, which we uh, were expecting for. For time peaks for. That's just a summary for for reference of the uh, of the analog behavior of the chip. But basically, maybe just one thing to highlight is that depending on the mode that you're using, the uh, electronic noise is somewhere between sixty five and eighty electrons RMS, which means that you can run the threshold somewhere between five hundred and seven hundred electrons, let's say, uh, on the um, uh, on the detection side. These are images showing the threshold adjustment. So every pixels has a local threshold which can be adjusted. And if you had some issue with, uh, let's say, poor design where you had um, uh, systematic uh, variations here, you would see those on the threshold adjustment. But you can see some difference between the top and bottom of the matrix here, but not much. And in terms of noise, basically all of the pixels have somewhere between 550 electrons noise here. And over the peripheral areas is a little bit higher. It's about 60 electrons, and that's because we have these extra pieces of metal which are which are used on top of the uh, of the reader electronics. That's an image of the chip with a 300 micron thick sensor on top of it. So this is the you're looking at the back of the sensor here. These are the wire bonding pads at the top and bottom of the reader chip, and this is an image taken using the strontium source, which is uh, something I showed earlier. This is a 10 second exposure. And here we ran the threshold of 800 electrons, and we basically sent the full information off chip. So there was basically 1.6.1 million packets of information used here to generate this uh, to generate this image. And that's an image of um, of a fish, a small dry fish, which we use typically to to look at the how clean our, our images are. And basically, what you can see is there are very very few missing pixels in the entire image. This is the image, the raw image shown, so not um, unprocessed data completely. And here we had a, correct, a flat field corrected image to get rid of the variation in the X-ray exposure here in the background to show really how how nicely the, um, the detector is working. So as I mentioned, I've shown some examples here of other applications of these detectors. There have been a whole uh, variety of different applications in the X-ray domain in neutron imaging, electron detection and, and microscopy, time of flight mass spectrometry, uh, various satellite systems. I, I don't have time to go into all of those here, but I invite you to look at literature if you're, if you're interested. And as well as those, we have a number of applications at CERN, which are either using our chips directly or using know-how which we developed in the context of the collaboration for, um, uh, for high energy physics. And perhaps I'll just mention one of these here. So if we look at the, uh, the timeline of developments. So the Medipix 2 collaboration, we made Medipix 2, Timepix, and then this Timepix 2 chip much later. 
He made a pick three collaboration, we made two chips. He made a pick four collaboration, two chips in that time frame. But what you can see is that for the LHCB experiment, the VeloPix chip was directly derived from the TimePix E chip. And we expect that a new version of VeloPix 2 will be directly derived from the TimePix uh, 4 developments. So just to summarize then, we, these detectors were developed as tracking detectors for use at the LHC. For the time being, basically, if you have to deal with such high event rates as we have at the LHC, the other solutions being investigated just now, like monolithic, are still not there yet. So hybrids are the only solution for the time being which can work in such high rate environments with, with clean information. The time picks and Medipix family of chips has been uh, developed over the last 20 years or so. Medipix 3 is used in a hospital, in a hospital scanner now, providing large, uh, high resolution spectroscopic X ray images. The Time Peak 3 and Time Peak 4 chip, when combined with a silicon sensor, basically provide noise free bubble chamber like images with always on triggerless readout, if you like. And I think we believe that the potential of this approach is currently a little bit underestimated in our community, but I'm hoping that will be resolved in time. And Time Peak 4, with its um, 200 picosecond time stamping, can be tailed in four sides using through silicon vias. And then finally, um, genetic developments such as Time Peaks provide great scientific and commercial opportunities, but also feedback into our core business at CERN here, which is uh, high energy physics. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Uh, thank you too uh, for an interesting topic, uh, for an informative presentation. As a future engineer, I was interested, thank you. Uh, Mr. Michael, we have a few questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Um, would you like to read them to me? Or? Uh, is the root system actively used nowadays for calculation and visualizations? Um, root systems used by many people in the collaboration uh, for, by the root, you mean the root uh, analysis system, I guess? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's used by a lot of people in the collaboration for, um, especially for visualizations, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, on first slide, you have Canada. I don't understand, do you know what this? Uh, I, don't, I don't recollect Canada. Oh, this doesn't work. I don't see anything about Canada. I don't know. <laughs> Not in the list of, uh, of uh, I guess the person means this slide here. Uh, maybe second, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have any Canadian um, uh, collaborators for now, no. I don't see a Canada. No. <laughs> OK, uh, that's really interesting case uh, concerning the development of small scientific devices as uh, substitutes for large scientific equipment. Uh, are there any other cases of this? I, I think there are some efforts using other detectors to make things which are portable, yes. Uh, I'm not that familiar with those. I, I know that the the chip developed, the monolithic chip developed by Alice uh, uh, for the Al the Alpi chip for for the uh, LHC experiment. Alice, I think, has been used in other applications, but I'm not sure if it's really mm -hmm. in such a portable way as, as ours. I mean, the, the big the big benefit of having such a big collaboration is that you have many people all working on the same chip, and so they tend to uh, create um, different things and in particular in terms of the miniaturization of the uh, of the data systems the IEAP group in Prague have been pioneering that and the Advacam company have taken over a lot of that e effort in uh, basic basically in a commercial uh, environment thank you uh, why is the delta electron track was not a straight line ah that's that's a maybe a physicist can answer that better than I can but my 
understanding of being an electronic engineer playing with electrons, so like, like with the strontium source here and my silicon sensor. When electrons interact with silicon lattice, they interact with the shells of the electrons and they're deviated as they go, as they go through the, the, the lattice. So where you have a high energy uh, proton, um, um, a high energy particle such as a, a muon or a, or, a, or a proton going at very high energies, those basically don't interact much with the lattice, but just um, deposit charges that go with the electrons. They have a much stronger interaction with the with the electrons of the lattice, and the electron track is typically uh, squiggly. It's like a worm. So. Uh, and we have two hands, Alex Todorov. Uh, can you say? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the seminar. I, I wanted to ask about the time resolution of time peaks three, mm -hmm. but then I guess now I need to ask about time resolution of time, time peaks four, <clears throat> because uh, it's from the LHC perspective, right? <clears throat> In principle, time resolution of 100 picosecond or something like that uh, is, can be used to distinguish between the pile of events. You know, that's what LHC experiments aim for. Because one and a second of speed of light uh, means something like 30 centimeters. So if you go lower, then you, you, you can distinguish actual vertices right, with the help of time. So I was wondering, what are the possibilities to improve that resolution? But then uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, to clarify a little bit, uh, also ask you to, to clarify a little bit the, how the time resolution of time peaks four is uh, uh, right, it, 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 uh, is achieved. So okay. each of your clocks is constructed of current inverters, you say, and, and so each period has like fine grain uh, period to it, right? So you can read it. Yeah, there are a number of ways of answering that. So the, basically when you come to having a, a large area chip like ours, there, there are two challenges. One is to get the time precision locally uh, as precise as possible. And the second is to have a reference locally, which is adequately precise as well. And both are equally challenging. Now, I didn't mention the second part in my presentation because of lack of time. But for the first part of the question, so basically in time peaks four, um, when the discriminator fires, we start up this oscillator, which oscillates at uh, 640 megahertz which gives it the 1.6 nanoseconds as we had in time peaks three. Uh, so basically you have a counter, which counts the number of clock ticks of, of the, that oscillation. Uh, but that oscillator is composed of a number of kind of current stars inverters, if you like, which are connected in a loop. And the internal state of those at the moment that the next rising edge of the clock comes. So the, next, so the, the uh, oscillator starts with the rising edge of the clock. You start counting ticks. You stop with the rising edge of the next, next clock cycle, and that gives the uh, number of 1.6 nanosecond intervals. And then the internal state of the VCO gets you down to the 200 picosecond level. In terms of the propagation of the reference to the, uh, to the pixel matrix, there's a whole paper on that, because basically you cannot put a 5 gigahertz uh, clock on such a chip because the power consumption would be enormous and all of the uh, systematics would be terrible. So what we do is we have a, a kind of clever system whereby we send a 40 megahertz clock up and down each column, each double column. And that clock is delayed by a very precise amount between the different pixels so that the clock seen by each super pixel is slightly different one from the other all the way through the matrix, but it's locked at the bottom. So you have a, a kind of phase lock loop, if you like, of the clock. And that's how we by using a 40 megahertz clock can get to the sub 200 nanosecond precision we need for the, uh, for the clock reference at the level of the pixel. Now going to the next part of the question, yeah. which is time peaks, let's see the next, uh, how can you improve on this 200 picosecond time bin? So that's the time bin, remember not the time resolution. Um, we think, so we're starting to work now on the Verlopix design we're hoping there to get somewhere around 50 to 100 picoseconds 
with all the because we're we're switching from 65 nanometer CMOS to 28 nanometer CMOS, so our electronics gets a bit faster. But of course, there are all those other features and aspects to take into consideration in the design. So I, I would bet we could get to 50, but we, we really have to see. So okay. thank you. Yeah. Okay, good luck with that then. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. That's the question. Thank you. And next, Alexander Korg, please. Alexander, your microphone is switched off. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. And uh, actually, I wanted to ask first about, uh, about energies uh, before to ask questions. So which energy range you are sensitive? In, in the tables, it was uh, for, for electrons and for, for photons. Uh, for electrons, it is uh, ki kilo electron volts starting from. Or... Yeah. So basically, the uh, the... The fundamental limit in our electronics is that the front end noise is typically 50, 60, 70, 80 electrons. Okay. And we'd like to have noise free images. So we tend to set the threshold uh, well above that level. So typically we run at five or six or 700 electrons threshold. So anything which deposits more than, let's say, 500 electrons, we can detect. Now, if the sensor is silicon, Five, five kilo electron volts or? So, wait, I'm not finished. If, this, oh. if, the, electron, if the sensor material is silicon, this 500 electrons corresponds to 500 times 3.6. So it's something like uh, uh, 1,500, uh, 1 1.6 kV, something like that. Uh, uh -huh. So typically we, we uh, yeah, yeah. I think a practical lower limit would be about 3 keV in terms of the, the lower limit in uh, energy which we are sensitive to in silicon. Uh, can, can you decrease it in principle? I mean that uh, I, I'm interested in the for, for photo, um, uh, uh, photo emission experiments and the sensors so like okay. a channel plate and to, to measure low energy electrons. Yeah. So I didn't mention this at all, but we have a number of groups working on different solutions for using our chips in such applications. Um, there is a, already a commercial um, product available from Amsterdam Scientific Instruments, whereby they have a uh, basically a camera. And this camera, which contains a TimePix chip with um, a, visible, a visible sensitive window in the back, let's say, is connected to a, 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 an image intensifier. So when a photon, a visible photon comes in, it's amplified by the image intensifier, and then the amplified signal is then sent to the uh, to the sensor for for detection. So that's how you can get to lower energy detection. And then probably a more elegant solution has been developed by our colleague in uh, in Ferrara, in Massimiliano Fiorini, and there he has a he's constructing a tube, which would have a photocathode in the front, and the microchannel plate uh, inside, and then a naked uh, time peak four chip uh, as the readout plane of the microchannel plate. So basically, you have a visible photon. It's a photocathode uh, generating a single photoelectron, which is drifted towards the MCP, multiplied by say five to get five thousand electrons, and then that's uh, drifted onto the naked uh, time peak four chip. And in fact, we've done um, we've built systems based on time peaks and many peaks too. Uh, on on the same principle and that works. So the way to get to lower energies is to do something to amplify the signal. Uh, but uh, I was wondering whether you can uh, detect uh, the event when uh, you have a gamma gamma photo gamma photon, and then it uh, it just excites the electron in your detector, and you measure this electron, the trace of electron. Could you identify this event that you have photo electron excited in your detector? And you see the track of this electron. Yeah, so the gamma, uh, which energy of gamma do you? I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, the, the energy, you, you, you see, you see the, uh, the, the, uh, the gamma, uh, the traces of the, of the gamma, uh, gamma photons, right? Yeah, so you can see, so in the Compton camera example, you have yeah. gammas coming in, 
they emit the Compton electron locally, which is then detected. And then the, 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 uh, the, the, the Compton scattered uh, photon is then detected elsewhere. And detected yeah, but, 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 but uh, gamma, uh, gamma, uh, gamma photon can be completely absorbed and emit the electron from your, from your detector, from the yes. material of your detector. Yeah. And this electron should, should, uh, should leave trace in your... Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so if, you put, um, if you put a high energy gamma source, so say 500 keV gamma source or yeah. a few hundred keV gamma source on top of a silicon sensor, you only see electrons. Uh -huh. You don't see the gammas because they go straight through. But you see plenty of, uh, of Compton scattered electrons, yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, OK. Any questions? I see there's a few things in the chat. Um, I don't understand. One says devices for central nervous system. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is the question or like uh, proposition. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's better to answer that one by email. I guess <laughs> it looks uh, looks a bit too detailed unless the author is willing to explain it. Maybe uh, I think it's Alexi Bazale. Maybe you could write me an email and I could try to reply by email. Yeah, we'll help to contact. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. okay, maybe if no question, I I I I had a, one one more question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, so I, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, this: uh, how you how you can see uh, how how you can do the slices. I understand how how magnetic tomographer works because uh, you have gradient of magnetic field. But mm -hmm. how, in your case, you can you can see different slices? Okay, so you you're referring to the the art the art example I showed the, the painting. Y yes. Uh, yeah. So basically. Um, Trying to find the back. No, 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 not about art, but but, but I mean uh, when when you show the lag, for example. Uh, ah, I... okay. Um, basically, computed tomography is a standard medical uh, modality now. So, uh -huh. if you go to the so the, it is it is just rotation or something like yeah. That. So basically, the, the the gantry rotates around the body. Mm -hmm. You have a, a source on one side, a detector on the other, and by reconstructing all of the Okay, okay. The, uh, so, so, so mathematically... Uh, it's a mathematical reconstruction. What we add is that instead of having for each point in the image uh, what's called a Hounsfield unit, which is basically the, the intensity of absorption of x-rays on that spot, per voxel, we have a spectrum, okay? So you can tell something about the material of the, uh, uh, of, of the inside of the body. And that's why we think that <clears throat> if you can develop appropriate, let's say, nano metal particle tagged biomarkers, it's a long way to say that, uh, you could maybe try to make um, uh, functional images as well as morphological images of the body using x-rays. So for the time being, x-rays are used for morphology and for function, you use PET basically. And, and our, our big hope would be that we could do some of the things requiring a PET examination with X-rays by by playing with the uh, the spectroscopic absorption. Okay, thank you. I don't see any questions. So maybe is the end of our meeting. Yeah. Well, thank you for the questions. It was interesting, uh, an interesting discussion. And uh, I wish you luck for the, the next days. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the webinar. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.
Bye. Thank you. Thank you.